Hello, I'm Ruth Werner, and this is my audiovisual sidebar to accompany my column, Boiling Over, The Frustrations of Hydra Denitus Superativa, which you will find in the March-April edition of Massage and Bodywork magazine. In that article, I introduce the idea of Hydra Denitus Superativa, which I'll just call HS, as either an autoimmune or an autoinflammatory condition. Now, I had never been aware of this category of auto-inflammatory diseases or how they might be different from autoimmune diseases. So I'm using this little sidebar to indulge my pathology nerd self a little bit to explore this further. And I'm really glad that you have decided to come with me. To get us into this discussion, we have to do little brief review of our innate versus our adaptive immune system mechanisms. You probably remember that our innate immune system agents are mechanisms and cells that we are born with. They include things like our barriers, intact skin or mucous membranes, also our non-specific white blood cells, that is white blood cells that'll attack anything that they identify as foreign, along with all the inflammatory chemicals that we secrete that makes everything more aggressive. That is our innate immune system. And it doesn't care what type of antigen, what type of non-self is present. It behaves the same way, no matter what the situation is. It attacks every antigen from rhinovirus to shrapnel with essentially the same strategies. By contrast, our acquired or adaptive immune system agents rely on the actions of our specialized T cells and B cells that are trained to recognize, attack, and remember specific pathogens. In fact, I learned this whole thing as specific immunity, but I think that the term adaptive immunity really is better. In an adaptive immune system first exposure to a pathogen, a nonspecific white blood cell, that's one of our innate team, presents a section of a cootie to T cells. Usually this happens in a lymph node. And the exact right T cells are woken up by this exposure and they clone into a whole team of T cells, helper Ts and killer Ts and memory Ts and suppressor Ts. The helper T cells then wake up exactly the right B cells, which clone into plasma cells. Those are the rapid fire antibody factories. And they also clone into memory B cells. Battle rages out in the tissues with both innate and adaptive immune system cells. When the pathogens are all killed and vanquished, or at least chased into hiding, then our memory T's and our memory B's continue to circulate through the body. They are primed for action and ready to reenact the whole process if that pathogen ever shows its dirty face again. And that is what we call immunity. I hope that this is ringing some ancient bells that may go all the way back to massage school. Autoimmune diseases... This includes things like multiple sclerosis and lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and several others. These are conditions in which agents of our adaptive immune system make a mistake. So T cells or B cells or antibodies or all of them look at something like the lining of our joint capsules at our knuckles. And they think that the cells in there are trying to kill us. So they try to kill those cells first. And this is a description of rheumatoid arthritis, of course. But if it's an attack against myelin in the central nervous system, then we call it multiple sclerosis. If it's an immune system attack against myelin in the peripheral nervous system, this is Guillain-Barre syndrome. And an immune system attack against the insulin producing beta cells of the pancreas is type one diabetes. Many autoimmune diseases involve a component called autoantibodies. These are weird, identifiable antibodies. Remember, these are produced by activated B cells. And these autoantibodies attack some target that is not actually a pathogen, like beta cells or myelin or synovial membranes. Autoantibodies are closely associated with autoimmune diseases, but it's not exactly a one-to-one -one relationship. 
it is possible, not typical, but possible to have an autoimmune disease and not have autoantibodies in the blood. And it is possible, in fact, not that uncommon to have autoantibodies in the blood without having an autoimmune disease. But the association between these two things, autoantibodies and autoimmune diseases, it's very close. And having both a positive blood test for autoantibodies plus signs and symptoms of a recognized autoimmune disease definitely supports a good, solid, reliable diagnosis. So that's a quick peek at innate immunity, uh, adaptive immunity, and autoimmune diseases. Here's this new thing, autoinflammatory diseases, which according to some specialists now includes hydrodenitis suppurativa. These diseases, these autoinflammatory diseases are also linked to immune system dysfunction. But instead of rogue T cells and B cells and autoantibodies, the hyperactivity in these situations is related to innate immune system agents, nonspecific white blood cells, and especially in a great big way, inflammatory chemicals. And that does seem to be the case with HS. We have these cycles of big inflammatory action at the apocrine sweat glands of some people, and this results in these big painful boils and lots and lots of scar tissue and no autoantibodies. I looked up some examples of other diseases that are classified as autoinflammatory, and I was surprised to find that they are rare and obscure, and that doesn't describe hydrodenitis suppurativa at all. According to NIAMS, that is the National Institutes of Allergic and... According to NIAMS, which I can't remember all that it stands for in this moment, most autoinflammatory diseases are related to specific genetic mutations. They can be inherited or acquired. They are often identified in early childhood. They are lifelong situations. And a short list of autoinflammatory diseases includes things like familial Mediterranean fever, cryopyrin-associated periodic syndromes, TNF receptor associated periodic syndromes, deficiency of IL-1 receptor antagonist, and of course, hyper IgD syndrome. If you are familiar with any of these, you are way ahead of me. Exactly none of these have ever made my lists of diseases that anyone has ever asked me about. The most common symptoms shared by most of these include recurrent fever, plus any combination of chills, muscle and joint inflammation, inflammation of internal organs, skin rash, GI symptoms, including nausea and diarrhea, mouth or genital sores, redness and swelling around the eyes, swollen lymph nodes, and a potentially dangerous sign called amyloidosis, which involves the buildup of certain proteins in the tissues. And when that happens in the kidneys or the lungs, it can be really serious. So what does this all mean for us, this difference between autoimmune diseases and autoinflammatory auto diseases? Truthfully, not much. It's interesting. And we may find as we learn more about the immune system that some other conditions might fit better under that autoinflammatory umbrella. But really at this point, it's knowledge for the sake of knowledge, not necessarily for the sake of client safety. Autoinflammatory diseases are typically treated with different strategies than autoimmune diseases, but that's for a conversation between a patient and their doctor. For us, whether hydrodenitis suppurativa is autoimmune or autoinflammatory or neither doesn't have to make a big difference. We always want to know about our client's health. We want to know what medications they're taking and if they have any active skin lesions. HS is at very least a local contraindication for massage, as much for client comfort as for any other reason, because it's painful. The lesions may have active bacteria, but that is incidental rather than causative. That is, bacteria grow because of inflammation and blocked ducts. The blo inflammation and blocked ducts are not the result of aggressive bacteria. We still don't want to spread bacteria around, or we don't want to spread them from the client to ourselves or anyone else, 
but really basic hygienic precautions will prevent that risk. If you have clients with hydrodenitus suppurativa, and chances are you do, whether or not they've told you, well, I hope this column and this video will help you feel a little more confident about working with them. Thanks for joining me for this little exploration of the difference between autoimmune and autoinflammatory diseases, and I will see you in the next edition.